Uh, good morning, uh, President and CEO Grant, uh, Dr. Thompson, um, distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all of the participants uh, this morning. The Korea Foundation Forum was launched to raise awareness and understanding in Korea of the various international and social issues that affect all of us, spoken by those <clears throat> eminent persons who make them happen. I'm very proud and honored to have the opportunity to present the President and CEO of the Korea Foundation's longtime partner, uh, RAND Corporation, Dr. James Thompson, as a special speaker uh, this morning. I'm sure most of you have uh, today know well about a RAND Corporation and its contribution, particularly in the field of defense policy since its establishment in 1946. RAND, the world's most renowned research institute, has approximately 1,600 staff members, and nine out of them, uh, 960, are dedicated to research activities in a wide range of fields including energy, environment, security, population, and healthcare. RAN also provides graduate school programs. The Parody RAN Graduate School, or PLGS, is the world's leading authorities in public policy analysis. The PLGS has trained and produced many of the world's leaders, including the ones who are attending this forum today. Over the last two decades, RAND Corporation and the Korea Foundation have been closely working together to enhance the bilateral relationship between my country and the United States, nurturing exchange of constructive ideas between the policymaking communities of both countries. As many of you here are aware, the Korea Foundation, together with RAND, has established the very first Korea Policy Chair at RAND uh, this past May, and Dr. Han Jebong was appointed as the Korea Policy Chair. It is my firm belief that the, uh, the Korea Policy Chair will contribute to consolidating RAND's capabilities in its research activities relating to the Korean Peninsula, serving as a fundamental resource for the promotion of our mutual interest. Today, Dr. Thompson will talk to us about an important topic titled Change of Political Polarization in the United States. Uh, recently, a number of significant developments have been unfolding in the United States. Some are good and some are not, including the launching of the Obama administration and the outbreak of the international financial crisis. And we all know that in order to successfully manage the challenges we face, consolidated domestic support is a must. Today's forum indeed occurs at an opportune juncture, and I believe it will provide us a good opportunity to learn about the political polarization in the United States and how the United States and the policymaking community are coping with it. Dr. Thompson, a trained physicist, has been serving as the president and the CEO of the RAND since 1989. His list of accomplishments includes outstanding services as the director of the RAND's research programs in various foreign and defense policy fields, and also served as the executive vice president prior to his appointment as the president. He also worked at the White House, serving as a member of the National Security Council staff in charge of defense and arms control matters. Now, on behalf of the Korea Foundation, it is with great pleasure that I present to you Dr. James Thompson, the President and CEO of the RAND Corporation, President Thompson. Thank you very much, um, Chairman Yim. Um, I just want to add, I was, he, he, he saved me a lot of words by explaining the chair, the Korea Policy Chair. I want to uh, just uh, express my thanks to the Korea Foundation and you, Chairman Yim, for the 
support of this chair. Uh, and I want to also thank the other people who hear the, both the current and future supporters of this chair. So we're, we're really excited about this opportunity uh, to broaden our work. We do a lot of work on issues related to Korea, but to broaden the, that work. I'm going to talk to you today about American politics and give, in the course of that, give you a, a sense of the role of the RAND Corporation in it. Uh, I'm not a student of Korean politics. I don't understand it at, de at a detailed level. Um, maybe, though, in the course of this, you'll see some things that are familiar and some things that are not, and maybe might even give you some ideas for a future, future work in political uh, studies here. The RAND Corporation was founded by people who believed that it would be possible to bring science to politics. Now that is a, if you think about that for very long, that is a really big idea because these are two very different domains. Science uh, has uh, no deadlines. Science looks uh, to the long term. It, uh, we didn't, no one told Albert Einstein, you must produce those four papers in 1905. Uh, science has an agenda driven by the curiosity of the researcher, not by anything else. The, no, the, thr the thirst for knowledge. And t science has extraordinarily high standards of evidence. Uh, because we want to be sure that when we find things that we are correct. On the other hand, the public, in public life, there are deadlines. Things have to be done on certain days. Events force timetables. It's not possible to sort of say, well, I'll get that done in six years if the, if the issue has to be taken care of in the next three weeks. Uh, Science um, uh, is driven not by curiosity. I mean, not, so, I mean, politics is driven not by curiosity. Did I say science or politics? Poli uh, uh, but by, by the events of, of uh, the affairs of mankind, about political needs and the like. And finally, with respect to evidence, well, I'll leave that for you to think about uh, with respect to politics. Now, when we combine these things, we have to make compromises. We make compromises on the first two. We know we have to get our work done to meet uh, political deadlines. We know we have to follow the needs of society. Yeah, and, but we have to, but we stick with the view that the standards of evidence and analytical thought are of the most important. So our, our core values are equality and objectivity. Turns out, though, that objectivity is not always desirable. Former Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan said, everyone is entitled to their own opinions, but they're not entitled to their own facts. But in fact, people do believe they're entitled to their own facts sometimes. And uh, when you come out with other facts, you can find yourself, as we do, especially if you have the reputation that we have, you can find yourself in some political difficulties. And I'm just going to show you very briefly, and I'm not going to spend any time on them, just a couple of, uh, is this the one that moves it? <clears throat> Let's try this, like that. I got it. OK, just a few things. This is first in the domestic policy field, where we have found ourselves embroiled in controversies in recent years. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. Uh, but uh, they would, uh, some cases, they would seem to be not all that controversial, like the first one. Um, but I can tell you, it's controversial. And uh, and we, uh, I have scars on my back to prove it. And we have um, you know, every one of these has proven to be controversial because there are ideologies that believe in certain facts, and. Uh, uh, and and um, ideologies that, for example, don't want more women in the labor force. Similarly, we've had controversies on in national security. Um, I'll only mention that today's news it regards missile defense, uh, and you can be sure that uh, 
uh, some of our studies of effectiveness, old studies of effectiveness of missile defense systems will be cited on one side or the other as the debate over missile defense in Europe unfold. The um, founding fathers of the United States anticipated that there would be uh, factionalism and argumentation among different political outlooks, and they thought it would be a good thing. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this history. Here's a few just interesting quotes here from uh, a few of the papers that were written at the time that the U.S. Constitution was ratified. And the basic point of the Federalists there that was uh, led by James Madison was that uh, factionalism wasn't really, it's, it wasn't really a bad thing. It would, we would be able to create through the medium of the Congress an opportunity to hear all different viewpoints and bring all those different ideas together and find the best solution. Uh, and, uh, but the people who were against the Constitution in 1788 felt that this was simply impossible and that the country would sooner or later be torn apart. And they used the phrase that will be stand like a house divided against itself, uh, quoting the Bible, and, uh, and that uh, it, would, it would fall. They, they were actually right because by 1861, the country fell into a civil war. But after that civil war, uh, the, Fed, the view of the Federalists seemed to hold sway for mo most of the, of the time. Um, but, let's, but let me see if, I'm, I'm now going to answer the question, is, is anything changing recently that means that this bipartisan approach, for example, the approach that taken by the United States during the Cold War, is uh, in, in any way at risk? And um, we're going to start first by looking at some data on how the U.S. voters uh, perceive themselves. And I'm using, I actually now got some better data, but I'm going to use this for now. Uh, this is basically how they see themselves as whether they're Republicans or Democrats. And there's two different uh, years I've used here, 1990, when the Republicans were in the White House in 2008. And on the left is the Democrat, people who say they're Democrats. And on the right, people who say they're Republicans. And in between are the people who lean Democrat or say they lean Democrat, lean Republican, or really are truly independent, or, they, or some, some cases they just don't know. Uh, and you can see here, it's pretty stable. Uh, hasn't changed a lot. There's a pretty substantial middle ground. If you add those three together, they're actually bigger than the other two. So you wouldn't see in the American population uh, too much grounds to say that the American population is deeply polarized because of this substantial middle ground, what might be called moderates. Um, now, the only change, by the way, it's noticeable in this period of time, the Republican support went down, and I think uh, that's because of the Iraq war. So that's, uh, but it didn't, you know, change, you know, 5% or so. So, so, and most of that went over to the other, to the independents. Now I'm going to talk about the Congress. And the, uh, I'm now going to introduce some analytical uh, uh, mumbo jumbo. I don't want to, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I'm going to have to ask you to take me on faith. Um, the measurements of, uh, of political leanings in the Congress uh, have historically been done by uh, interest groups, the American Conservative Union and so forth. But this, these are two, this is done by two political scientists. This is a measurement and it's got a suitably complicated name. And it's uh, what's called a spade. For those here who, there probably are some people here who are familiar with some of these analytical tools. This is called a spatial model of voting behavior. And I'm not going to get into that. But you need to know three things about it. The first one is that it's a, uh, um, a study of all roll call votes in the House and the Senate since 1789, unless they were unanimous or near unanimous votes. So by now, there's a little over 100,000 votes like that. That's a lot of data for those of us who like data. Uh, the second thing you need to know, and this is where the, the methodology gets complicated, and I can explain some of it later if somebody wants to get into it. 
but it basically positions, based on their voting record, it positions each member of the House and the Senate in a n-dimensional plot. Sorry to bring in n-dimensional, uh, but it's necessary. Uh, because different, quote, dimensions operate politically. And it's, but what they find, though, is through most of U.S. history, they don't need many n dimensions. Usually two are enough. So you might, then it's much easier to look at because you can look at it on a piece of paper. And the one dimension, what's called the first dimension, is almost all has been historically been about economics. In particular, about what role the government should play in the economy. Um, that's been true since the very beginning of the Republic, and it was always true in every Congress. The other dimension has historically been uh, about usually regional issues, slavery, a north-south issue, um, later on civil rights, or during a period of time when we argued about how our money should be should be created, whether it should be based on a gold or so gold and silver standard. But the interesting thing now is that there is there's only one dimension. Only since 1970, one dimension is enough to explain all voting behavior. That by itself is interesting, and uh, and that's the dimension that is the economic dimension. But it turns out other issues have fallen onto it, collapsed to it. And the last thing you need to know is that members of the Congress are allowed to move. So from one Congress to the other, they're allowed to move. And you can watch the movement of congressmen, political movement from left to right, if you want to use the one dimension. You can uh, watch them move. They don't move. That's the other key finding. They do not move very much. Uh, there are occasionally members of Congress who make big journeys across but they're very unusual. Most of them do not move during their career. That turns out to be important. OK, so um, what, um, what do we know about this, how this measure looks, especially on this first dimension, which I said since 1970 is the, is the important one? And here I'm going to show you a chart from the 93rd House of Representatives elected the same year that Nixon was elected for his second term. And I like the, you don't, I'm not going to actually talk to you about the x-axis here, the, uh, the uh, horizontal axis. I'm only using this chart because I like the fact that you can see the R's and the D's. R's are Republican, D's are Democrat. And on the, on the y-axis is the score. Positive is conservative, negative is liberal, simply a convention that has no political connotation by these, uh, these political scientists. And what you see here is there is a substantial amount of mixing between Republicans and Democrats in 1973. You can see that. They're mixed all together and so forth. But there is a difference between the parties. If you just take the average score of the Republicans and subtract the average score of the Democrats, you get kind of an index of poll, what might be called polarization, how far apart are the parties, and it's 0.55. So that's an index number for polarization in 1973. So now I'm going to move the chart, move it ahead to 9, 2000, 2003, 30 years. Now you see something interesting. They've pulled apart. Uh, in fact, in this chart, there are only two overlapping members. One on the, uh, the, the R down there to the lower left of the R group is, uh, has a slightly more liberal score than the D over there to the right. Now that R, some people in Korea will probably know that, might, might know this, uh, that uh, R. That was Congressman Jim Leach of Iowa. So a lot of people overseas know Jim Leach because he was very interested in foreign, uh, foreign affairs. Uh, he was defeated in the next election. Uh, he, he lost. Uh, on the right, that's Congressman, probably not known over here, is Congressman Ralph Hall of Texas. He switched parties the next year. So that by 2007, I'm going to show you that in a second, 
there was no uh, overlap at all between the two parties, none. Um, that by the, the index, the difference in the average now is 0.9 on this chart. As of the last Congress, it was 0.95. Let me show you that. I'm now going to uh, tip the, uh, turn this over so that the, this is just a distribution now. That's what density means. And in, in, in the liberal conservative dimension, that first dimension from the analysis is shown here for three different Congresses, now going all the way back into the late 60s. When you can see in the 60s, even into the late 80s, the Democratic Party had a substantial bump on the right, uh, overlapping with the, Demo with the Republicans who had a smaller but um, also a bump to the left. And by the, the last Congress, uh, they do not overlap. Now, I haven't got, I could show you a same, I showed you the, this, uh, this is the Congress, I could show you the Senate, and it would have a very similar chart. And I'll show you the Senate in a second, but the Senate would always look I identical. In fact, if the Senate chart on that blue a Democratic uh, part, on the Senate chart, in the last Congress, there were five senators who were the leftmost senators. They were Olympia Snow, Susan Collins, Gordon Smith, Norm Coleman, and Arlen Specter. Uh, Smith was defeated. Uh, Coleman was defeated. And Specter changed parties. Only Snow and Collins are left. They are the two left. Uh, are still in the are still de de uh, Republicans. They are the left mo they're leftmost Republicans. And those of you who are following this current debate over health care in the United States will know that the effort to forge a compromise in the Senate involves Senator Max Baucus, who would, by the way, appear to be on the right side of that red. Uh, of the of the of the Democrats, and uh, and who um, uh, and who uh, um, in, in the two uh, two of the three are are Collins and Snow, so that's what's left of bipartisanship. Now the 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 victims here, of course, have been the moderates because what happens, what's going on here, uh, what what's causing all of this, and why is this? Uh, what, what's the what's the background? This is now a chart that just shows the House and the Senate. Now that's simply that index of polarization. And now you see, uh, you know, it was high in the years after the Civil War, went down, and then went back up to today's levels. It's now the highest in history of the United States. Um, what's going on here is, is has to do with the constituencies of the, of the congressmen and the senators. And they are, what's really happening here is that the constituencies, and I'll show you some data, the constituencies of the congressmen and the senators are changing their political outlooks over time through a process that is, I will call sorting, geographic sorting. And as they, as they have sorted, there some of the, the members of Congress and the senators become out of step politically with their constituencies. Because remember, they don't change their views. But if their constituencies change their views, sooner or later, they will either lose, uh, like Congressman Leach, they will retire and then be replaced by somebody uh, who is more in tune with that constituency, or they will switch parties, like Specter. That doesn't happen very much. Um, so here, let's look at this constituency issue. Oh, maybe I won't. I'm going to get a little ahead of myself here before I get to constituencies. Um, this gets to this issue of the dimensions. And I mentioned that the first dimension was about the economy and the government. And those kind of issues listed there are classic issues regarding what role should the economy, should the government play in the economy. But now we find that these other issues are also aligned with those issues. In other words, I can predict that a senator who will, for example, be against the role of government in health care will also be a senator who will, who will be in favor of harsh, 
harsher punishment of criminals and who will be more in favor of attacking Iran with to, to stop their nuclear program than negotiating. And I can predict the opposite. There is, to my knowledge, and I've asked this to many audiences, there is no obvious underlying political philosophy that makes those things tie together. The economy, sure, but the rest of it, not obvious why those tie together. But they do. And um, so everything is now on one dimension. Now here comes the constituents. And this is a, a, a measurement of the uh, chop top of the chart first. <clears throat> this is an analysis of, of the demographic characteristics of, con of congressional constituencies. Now I'll focus first on the top. And it's simply using simple de demography to predict the voting behavior of the member from that district. Simple. How, how well does just demography do in predicting that? And the answer is, in 1973, it had a predictive power of about 18%. And by 2003, it had a predictive power of 37%. So during just demography, during that period, strength was got better and better at predicting the results of congressional voting. And if we then move to the what, what is in the analysis, and I'll go down here to the bottom, and I'll have to explain that a little bit, some college and so forth. The parenthesis on the right says what was favored by that characteristic, which party was favored by that characteristic in 2003. So it says here, people who had some college education but who had not finished college, were, their representatives were more likely to be Republicans than Democrats. Now, well, for example, at the bottom, a constituency that had more Hispanic rather than less was more likely to have a Democrat than a Republican. The arrows simply tell you the direction. If, if so, since Democrat is a negative number on here, college degrees, people with a college degree, well, they favored Democrats in 2003, or de their representatives voted Democratic in 2003. And those two arrows show you that during this period of time, that trend was getting stronger. And the one, the real strong trend is income of the constituencies associated with Republicans increasingly strong. So that's what that tells you. So we see there that at the simply at a demographic level, we're getting better able to predict who's, uh, who's going to support uh, who's going to be Republican or Democrat, and who, how, how strongly they will be liberal or conservative. Now, the, that means that what's, is there more than simply this? Why would those things matter? And the answer to that is that the, or at least the hypothesis is, that people are shifting themselves to be with people who are like them, not because of their political views, but because of what sociologists are referring to as way of life. And way of life characteristics are things like religion. And you can see some of that in the data. You can find that by church attendance. Um, but there could be things like the availability of bike paths, golf courses, Starbucks. You can just sort of make your own list uh, in, uh, in Korea, probably. What would be those things that would attract people to the same places? Now, the problem we have in understanding that sounds actually like it might be interesting to pursue, but we don't have data at what would be the community level about voting patterns. We only have the, the behavior of the, the members in the Congress. But we do know something about how people vote in counties. And, and that's interesting because counties are smaller than congressional districts. There are seven counties for every congressional district in the United States. The bad news for analysts like me is that not all of them are the same size. And some counties are really big, like Los Angeles County, which has 13 congressional districts. So, but all, but still, it's better, than, it's better than nothing. So let's look at some data regarding counties. These are, now, this is now the 1976 election when Jimmy Carter defeated Gerald Ford. 
And these are, this is a map of the United States by county. And you see there that the compel, what's called landslide counties, Democratic landslide counties are black. That's where Carter beat one by more than 20%. That's a landslide. Republicans, which are the gray, it's where, it's where Ford won by more than 20%. And then the white are the non-landslide counties. And what you see on this map is a lot of white. Look at Cal, keep your eye on California. Almost entirely white. Uh, keep your eye on Illinois. Entirely white except with some Republican areas in the middle, in the rural areas. And now I'm going to show you the election last November. And now what you first thing that catches your eye is that the white has got a lot less. And the next thing you notice is that, uh, say, to California, a lot of white still, but that's entirely <coughs> rural. The coast is black, Democratic. Look at uh, Illinois, all around Chicago, Cook County, black. Was not, was white before. And you can, everybody who looks at these maps who comes from the United States, or many of you studied in the United States, will probably go to the county where you lived and try to see what happened. I was briefing this recently to somebody from Oklahoma, and they said, what on earth happened to Oklahoma? And here's, there's Oklahoma, if you remember, that's the one with the funny panhandle there on, there it is, and there it is, there it is. Completely changed. So this gives some support with this idea of sorting geographically. Now we do know there are other things going on in the United States. And there are, so for example, news media and what people call the echo chamber. And that is now that we have the internet, specialized, we, we can go to where we want to go and hear only the people we want to hear. We don't have to listen to people who we don't like their ideas and so forth. But it does suggest this notion of like-minded people being with like-minded people. And we know from a lot of work, sociology, organizational behavior and the like, that that is bad. Groupthink, bad decisions. But you have people, I like the quote of the, the late playwright Arthur Miller on the eve of the 2004 election, said, how could, there be, how could the polls be neck and neck? I don't know a single person who's in favor of Bush. Uh, and of course, no surprise, he was living in the center of New York. Uh, that's, uh, that's the way it is. So, we are, the key point here is that we are sorting ourselves geographically. Uh, members will be, um, re be replaced or they will lose because the, the constituencies will change underneath them as a couple of, or that they will, uh, they will be, um, um, uh, replace when they retire. Uh, another couple of ways to look at this, by the way, for those who like, I'll skip that one, but for those who like uh, statistics, this is the standard deviation of the pr Republican presidential vote during all of the years from 48 to 2008. And um, what it means here, for those who don't remember any statistics, is if the vote was the same, if the Republicans got the same percentage vote in every county, then the standard deviation would be zero. And the more you, so if it were 40%, let's say, in every county, it would be zero. So the more you deviate from that, the larger the spread of the Republican votes across counties, which we see where some counties are almost totally Republican and some counties are almost totally Democrat. That's what that's about. So the bottom line of this is that we're in for, a, despite this, we're in for an extended period of political warfare in the United States. And because of this fact that in Congress, these issues have all become aligned, whether they be foreign affairs, crime and punishment, immigration, or place the government's role in the economy, the big issue, the sort of, uh, these will, this will fall, this will slop over into international affairs. And it has done so. Uh, and uh, although it's less affected, I would say, than these other issues. And you're seeing this today uh, on the health care bill, 
uh, on, we'll see it on cap and trade when that bill gets to the, uh, gets to the how, gets, finally gets to the floor. Uh, and we'll see it in all matter, we'll see it in financial regulations. We'll see it, uh, we see it now on issues like the GM bailout uh, and the like. And so uh, that's the, uh, I'll kind of stop there, except to tell you that for us, you know, we're in the middle of all of this. And we bring, uh, we bring everybody, we try to bring the facts and so forth. We've just learned over time that there are certain important things to do. Uh, you know, the research is what it produces, what it produces. And we stand behind it because we go through a process of peer review to be sure what we have to say is good. But we also are, have to be ready for the war over the release of any of our products. And these are the, some of the things we do uh, to do that so that the Rand Corporation can continue doing what it's done for the United States and increasingly for countries all over the world. And that is bring good, solid analysis to assist in making public policy decisions. We think in the middle of all of this warfare, there remains a strong role for that. And we know from those charts of the people I showed you earlier that there's a substantial thirst for it. Thanks very much for your time.